I've spoken at great length on this channel about the transformations in the Sonic franchise, and how cathartic of an award they can be to the most dedicated of players, or how they serve as the climax to the narrative-driven 3D games. But of all the different ways we've talked about these sparkly hogs so far, I never once thought we'd be talking about a sequel. I mean, Sonic Team has made it pretty clear they want nothing to do with their first attempt at a secondary Super Sonic, and yet somehow, all these years later, we now have what the fans and game files have dubbed Super Sonic 2. Could just be a placeholder, they could change that name any day now, and if it does, I'm sure I'll get plenty of annoying comments telling me this video's aged poorly. But anyway, yeah, while we don't have an official name yet, digging through those game files shows us that this name was indeed used internally. So that's what we're calling it in today's video. Before we get into it, need a shout out today's sponsor, Manta Sleep. Manta Sleep makes, well, sleep masks. The best in the world. They're made with soft, breathable material that manage to give you 100% blackout, and they have extremely adjustable, comfortable headbands that give you the perfect fit, and they do all of this without putting any pressure on your eyelids. But that's only the baseline expectations. Everybody sleeps a little bit differently, and may need more specific requirements to get the rest you need. But thankfully, they got plenty of types of masks. They have the cool mask that evenly distributes Contributes a cooler temperature to help soothe eyes and sinuses, a steam mask you can put on for just a few minutes to help relieve stress and dry eyes, a silk mask if you want a more comforting, smooth texture to help you relax and even helps prevent wrinkles and replenishes your skin cells, or if you're like me and you need to listen to something while you fall asleep, get their sound mask. This one has a pair of super thin Bluetooth headphones with easy to use speaker adjustments, 20 hours of battery life without any obnoxious low battery noises that interrupt your sleep. I personally went with their glow mask because it glows in the dark, which makes it kind of green in the middle of the night. Which, okay, I can't see it while I'm using it, but tell you what, made it super easy to find this thing while I'm stumbling around in the dark. If that sounds good to you, or would make a great gift for someone you know struggling with sleep, then be sure to use my link and use the code APOLOGIST, which will get you 10% off your order at checkout. Thank you again to Man of Sleep, and let's get on with the video. What makes this Super Sonic so much more super than Super Sonic? Well, it's his blue eyes. But even with this one simple change, the fanbase lost their collective minds when Goldilocks opened up his pretty peepers in that Final Horizons trailer. And it might seem like an overreaction to any normal human being, but trust me, this is pretty standard for Sonic fans. We take his eye colors very seriously. And as mundane as it can seem, Sonic changing his color context told me a great deal. The eye color alone already gave away why they chose that specific color and where the source of his new energy came from. But above all that, these blue eyes expressed the necessity for change. But to fully understand that change, we need to first understand why supersonic matters to frontiers. We've already talked about why supersonic matters in general in other videos, so I'd recommend checking that out. And if you got the time, maybe my frontier story analysis, because this video does build off some points and opinions I made there. But back to Frontier's take on Super Sonic, unlike any other game in the series, we do have something of a middle ground between the narrative importance and game-breaking reward. I've compared the boost stages of Unleash to the original special stages of the classic games, and I have seen that same comparison used with the cyberspace stages of Frontier's, and I can certainly see that. Even though we don't unlock the Super Sonic form to be used freely in the game, we also don't have to wait till the end of the game to bust out that golden goodness. Instead, Super Sonic fights serve as the end point for most of the Starfall Islands you explore throughout the game, and they are awesome. <laughs> The somber music of the open zone gives way to a heavy, powerful melody, fully embracing that rock energy of those early adventure days, and it gives us cinematic bombastic battles unlike any other when compared to all the previous iterations. The new combat mechanics on the open field are used here to great effect and are now ramped up to 11 as Sonic blasts around the battlefield with giant images of his feet and fists peppering the once unstoppable titans, his Psyloop launching these 
colossal beast into the air like it's nothing and pushing back against giant lasers, a constant barrage of missiles, and even going so far as to take up a sword that's so big it would make Cloud blush. The fights, like most other super battles, are not a mechanically deep experience, but they did still challenge the player in clever ways and amplified the combat abilities introduced in this game, finally giving the Super Hawks something more to do than just fly around, and the spectacle of it all cannot be denied. Taking from CyberConnect 2's playbook and going all in with the over-the-top anime action you would find in their Azura's Wrath game, which in turn was built off their ridiculous set pieces from their Naruto Storm series. I also think it's kind of fitting that CyberConnect 2 would go on to develop a game for the original Super Saiyan, and here in Frontiers, Super Sonic was finally embracing the shonen of it all, something that Sonic Team famously tried to avoid comparisons to for a very long time. There are now more obvious Dragon Ball parallels than ever before, but that doesn't matter. Super Sonic is a mainstay in pop culture on his own terms, and those comparisons only heighten the experience. The existence of the Super Saiyans has never bothered Sonic fans, and Super Sonic has never threatened the legacy of Goku. Everyone knows where glowy, spiky hair comes from, who cares? It's fun, and that's all that matters. And things only went harder with each new Titan fight. We'd get a new music track, new set pieces, even new finishing moves. Seriously, if you ever thought Sonic looked silly with a sword, then buddy, this game's not for you. Also makes me wonder, since Morio Kishimoto was the lead game designer for Sonic and the Black Knight, did he intentionally have Sonic fight? a big ass black knight in this game? Maybe this dude has been waiting for years to justify Sonic with the sword. This must be so cathartic. Anyway, yeah, the script for Frontiers is about as serious as a Sonic game ever got, but the Super Sonic fights showed me that they still emphasized having fun without sacrificing the tone of the overall experience. And this was all before the final boss of the game. As crazy as things got with each of these fights, I couldn't wait to see where they would end things. But before all of that, there was another big glaring problem Sonic had to tackle, his poisoning digital corruption. The ancients introduced in this game had created a digital reality known as cyberspace, which Sonic and pals merged with upon arriving to the Starfall Islands, and all the animal buddies got trapped in cages except for Sonic, but even when they're freed, they still remain in an incomplete digital state, not truly free from their merger with cyberspace. And what's worse, with each prison busted open, Sonic takes on more and more of this digital corruption, clearly hurting the hedgehog, shown to be growing weaker and weaker as he moves from island to island. And even when he transforms three separate times into Super Sonic, it has no effect, which is saying something since this transformation was able to burn off the metal virus, which, yes, is now canon to the game series. For now, anyway, I've lived through enough soft reboots and timeline contradictions when it comes to this franchise. Anyway, this all comes to a head after Sonic takes on all of the towers of Rhea Island, where he finally returns his friends to their normal state and even frees Eggman. But he also unintentionally frees the dark entity known as the End from cyberspace. If there's anything Sonic values more than freedom, it's his friends, and he would do anything to bring them back and give them their own freedom, even if it means sacrificing his own. And after finally taking on too much of the corruption, the world around him turns red, visualizing the intense pain he's enduring. But he eventually eventually goes still, his body frozen, trapped between realities, stuck with a fate worse than any of the other characters had endured. But he wouldn't have to endure it too long, because as much as he loves his friends, they love him just as much right back. And having only experienced their freedom for a brief few minutes, without a second thought, Amy, Knuckles, and Tails quickly decide to give it all up to give Sonic one more chance to save the world. And as flowery as I'm making it all sound, unfortunately this was the point in the narrative where things started to kind of fall off for some players, which is saying something since the game itself has definitely been showing a lack of polish throughout the adventure. And here, this felt lacking. This is how they concluded the threat of the digital corruption? His friends just whisked it away? Felt like a lot of buildup for a very unsatisfying payoff. And with hindsight, probably should have noticed this was a telltale sign that things were not going to get better. With the cyber corruption cleared, Sonic went super against the Supreme Titan. <laughs> Look at that gun. That's why Fang's no longer called a sniper. This is a sniper. <laughs> and the fight is, uh, well, is <laughs> well, it's not very good, especially compared to the other three. But hey, it's only the first phase. After a short fight, the Supreme Titan sprouts wings that don't do anything. <laughs> they don't even 
show up in the fight itself. But hey, that's fine. We still have one more battle after this, as the end leaves the defeated Titan behind and takes on the form of a planetary body. A little weird, but at least for me, I was curious to see where things went from here. Some of the most iconic boss battles are against orbs. Ask any Kirby or Final Fantasy fan, they'll tell you. And I feel like they were teasing something next level, as Sage says that not even Super Sonic, who'd been kicking the crap out of everything up to this point, would not be enough for this fight. Not this time. How was the game going to close things out after elevating expectations with each passing Super Sonic fight? By giving us a shmup battle, Sega made us play Galaga. Thought we would notice. But we did. Sage takes the same bot you just trashed, and apparently that's enough for Super Sonic to turn the tides against a moon that won't shut up. And eventually, we kill the moon, then we kill a kid. Sonic Adventure 2 fans rejoiced. Maria. This is what you wanted, right? This, uh, yeah, this is a pretty lackluster ending. I'd go so far as to say frustrating, both in terms of gameplay and storytelling, as they had not only built up these spectacular battles, but also spent a lot of time acknowledging the entire history of the series and a new element that could potentially tell its own story while tying together this complicated canon. Through the adventure, we slowly learn the history of the ancients, an alien race of beings who predate any other culture we have yet Yet seen in this series. And not only do they have a significant impact on the Chaos Emeralds themselves, it even helps explain where the hell Chaos and the Chow come from. And that Knuckles animation teased us with answers to long-standing questions about how this unique world works. After watching that short and playing through Frontiers, I came to assume that Sky Sanctuary was built by the Ancients. That would explain why there is advanced tech linking those ruins to the Hidden Palace. Maybe they could explain that. Maybe they could explain that mural found in Hidden Palace. Maybe this could even explain the Super Emeralds or Perfect Chaos. How does that transformation work? What could this say about the history of that floating island or the world at large? I was hoping that Frontiers could help explain the Emeralds' connection to their adopted planet and its inhabitants. Maybe it can shed some light on Sonic's relationship with the Emeralds. And since this race should know these gems literally better than anyone else we have ever come across in this series, with all the ties to Angel Island and clues about the Master Emerald, maybe, with the help of the Ancients, Sonic could finally tap into that long-lost potential of Hyper Sonic. I know that is a very specific, very selfish ask, but you can't blame an old fan for wanting to see that form finally properly acknowledged, canonized, and get the full cinematic experience that just wasn't possible on the Sega Genesis. And they had just released Sonic Origins. They had finally circumvented the legal issues that kept Sonic Three and Knuckles from being released this past decade. And again, they teased us with that Knuckles short animation. Surely there would be no better time than now to tap into that power one last time, and nope, you get Ikaruga. Yeah, I was a little disappointed to see that Hyper still had not made a return, but don't get me wrong, I did not expect to see it come back. Not really. I did, however, feel that they would surely give us a new form. Or failing that, since we have Sage using the Supreme Titan, maybe Maybe we would get a fight that combined the Titan with Super Sonic's powers or something ridiculous like that, but I mean I guess that kinda happened. But instead of anything awesome, the game instead gave us the weakest of the Titan fights, followed up with a gameplay style that had only appeared a couple of times in mini games. And while I appreciate the attempt to train the player for this battle, this still felt incredibly jarring. And putting the gameplay aside, it felt like we weren't given enough story for the Emeralds, the Ancients, Cyberspace, any of it. This all felt so rushed. And not in the way that makes sense for Sonic rushing because he runs fast, y you get it. And I wasn't the only one that felt that way. It was one of the most consistent complaints brought up during the initial release of the game. Even if you didn't expect Hypersonic or a new Cybersonic, the game itself made a big stinky deal about these super fights, but fumbled the spinball at the end. This is the battle that wraps everything up. That's the last note you are leaving your players walking away with. It's kind of lame. But as it turns out, the end wasn't the end.
After Sonic Frontiers launched, with its sales blowing past Sega's expectations, they went ahead and greenlit future free DLC updates for the game, promising a whole lot of stuff but not mentioning anything about a new final boss fight, at least not at first. But the outcry was loud enough to catch Sonic Team's attention, and as the year moved along and as updates rolled out, with just a month left before that final DLC was set to launch, Sega dropped a surprise trailer teasing us with an updated Supreme Titan, and Sonic, as you'd expect, goes super, but it doesn't stop there, as he lets off a secondary burst of crackling black and red energy, and now sporting those blue eyes, letting us know exactly where this final bit of DLC was eventually going to end. And the journey Sonic takes to achieve this form, and the role it ultimately plays, is pretty awesome, in terms of story, dialogue, and world building lore. In terms of gameplay, well that's an entirely separate discussion. But for the here and now, I'm staying focused on the narrative and the bigger part Super 2 might play for the franchise, best I can at any rate. Gameplay is still central to certain parts of this story, and also you need to let your boy sass a bit, this thing was kinda janky. With the update, we get a new story that can be found in a warp ring on Oranos Island. Gotta say, it looks like it came straight out of Sonic's second movie, but I'm not complaining, it's good to see these big suckers again. And from the start, this is where a critique of mine pops up, but stepping back, I can also see where they were coming from. Sage reveals that there might be more than one way to save the world. She can return Sonic's friends to their plane of existence, but it would once again come at a cost. Sonic would take on all of that cyber corruption, but this time, instead of trying to get rid of it, Sonic will have to master it. What was once his greatest threat on this adventure will now be forged into the one thing that can save them all from the end. Since the corruption comes from cyberspace and Sage is still a part of that realm, she can temporarily hold off that corruption. And while Sonic's friends track down the emeralds, the hedgehog himself must climb different towers and conquer different challenges to achieve this mastery and give them a fighting chance against the looming threat heading their way. This at first felt as hand wavy as the initial sacrifice on Rhea Island. Sonic is dead and then suddenly he's back. His friends are dead and now suddenly they're back. I just tried to save you. I'm not doing it again. And like a lot of other narrative elements we see in this final DLC, it may have gone down better if they had just baked everything into that vanilla release and let this stuff lay out a little more naturally. But doing it this way does two things. First off, it doesn't sacrifice what was put out there in the initial Frontiers release. As lackluster as many of us found that original Arenos ending, there are still plenty of people who probably love it for what it was, and their enjoyment still matters. Even if it does confuse the canon and god I am not looking forward to those debates, I do think that at this point, it was better to make the new story a separate choice. You can play both endings, and that's pretty cool. And secondly, as rushed as the start of this new story may seem, they still make the sacrifices Sonic and his friends made mean something. In either story, it's important for Sage to see just how far not just Sonic is willing to go, but also his friends. They've all endured a lot and are still willing to give even more. Sage learns how to define find these new wonderful feelings that sentience has brought her through this little found family and how powerful of a motivator these connections can be how love can push you to change the world in the original ending she learns that sometimes to protect what you love comes at a huge cost but here she learns that only working together can they accomplish the impossible and i do think that was completely intentional considering eggman's little bit of sass here no tedious speeches about the superpower of teamwork. But it really is about the power of teamwork, not just between Sonic, Sage, and Eggman, like the original ending, and no, not even just including Sonic's friends, but make no mistake, they are incredibly important, but they also need everyone else involved, and that includes the Ancients. Atop each tower, Sonic will find Cocos that look far more elaborate than any other we had seen so far, and that's because they represent the Titan pilots who lost their lives fighting the end. This answers a few questions that I had brought up in my original story analysis 
analysis, and yes, this can be seen as yet another Breath of the Wild parallel, but I for one greatly appreciated this inclusion. This gives us more context to their ultimate sacrifice and their motivations for even confronting Sonic to begin with. It gave the Titans a voice, and that voice was usually angry or unimpressed. Even with everything Sonic had already accomplished up to this point, he must pass one final test from each pilot, and it's here where Sonic, and in turn the player, face the most demanding tasks of the entire game. The tower climbs are no cakewalk, and the challenges that await Sonic at the top pushes his combat prowess to the breaking point. Sometimes, anyway. The difficulty between the towers is a little all over the place, but regardless of how hard or tedious or janky any of these fights can be, they all serve the same purpose. To teach Sonic how to properly read his opponents and parry their attacks, a mechanic that can be blatantly cheesed in the original game. But now he must tackle faster versions of old enemies. That means Sonic, in turn, must move faster than ever before. But not in the traditional sense. He can't outrun these problems, nor can he simply roll into a ball and power through them. At least, not yet. Before he can do anything else, he must first learn to balance that speed and power with patience and strategy if he has any chance to conquer this corruption. It's very rare for Sonic to have opponents that can match his speed, but they do exist, and when that happens, he needs to utilize his skills in other ways. Just to give an example, one of the most frustrating challenges is at the tippity top of Tower 2, where you are required to take out four shielded enemies within a time limit and with some heavy handicaps to your power. Now, normally you can side loop an enemy and just go hog wild, but thanks to that picked up speed, the shell drops back down real quick. And yet, you can slowly whittle away at the life bar, and I've heard that people have gotten pretty creative with their combos, but I believe the way you're meant to do this requires Sonic to bait an attack that exposes an enemy, and from there, he can move in close and wail on the dude while remaining aware of the boomeranging saw blade. This forces the player into a situation where they cannot cheese the parry, not if they want to take advantage of that brief window of vulnerability, and while a lot of the execution here could have used work, I do think the idea is solid. I think this was supposed to be the same idea for the upgraded ninja, as it was one of the first guardians Sonic ever faced that showed that this time, speed isn't enough. <laughs> now that I think about it, it's very interesting that the ancients have a lot of tech that seems to revolve around incredible speed. I always thought it was a little silly that random enemies could outpace Sonic the Hedgehog, especially those robot cheetahs. It's always robot cheetahs. But from this perspective, it can be seen that Sonic still has more to learn, even when it comes to his most natural abilities. Of course, I could just be making all of this up and maybe Sega will once again hire Ian Flynn to narratively justify strange design choices. Thanks for that dash pad lore, by the way, Sega. Definitely needed that. Where the hell are the rings? As Sonic conquers each trial, he earns the respect and validation of these long lost warriors who see their own courage in Sonic. And there are some obvious parallels between Sonic's crew and the original Titan pilots, making it clear that their heroic spirit has passed on to more than just little stone figures. And I really appreciate this about the DLC. The idea of the ancients is an alien one, quite literally. Making the Chaos Emeralds foreign to this world can potentially take away from the unique nature of Sonic's world, something I have spoken about before. But these interactions with the pilots and the traits they share with the modern day heroes shows just how much these beings, separated by literal time and space, have so much more in common than they realized. It doesn't matter where anyone comes from, doesn't matter where these silly gems come from, they are all still living beings, or at least once living beings, capable of love, empathy, and care for each other and for life in general, even if that life has long since passed, be it in gooey water aliens or blue anthropomorphic hedgehogs. There is a shared humanity that they see in each other and in turn, we literal humans can connect with. This was a lesson learned on the very first island with Amy, seeing a love that lingered eons after passing. Knuckles followed suit, seeing ruins that connected these ancients with his own lost people, and Tails through a little Coco learning to find his own courage even in the face of death. And let's be real, both Tails and Eggman certainly appreciated the technology of these old cooey boys. But yeah, even Eggman, he was able to find a familial connection, something he may have always wanted, which was ever so subtly alluded to in Sonic Adventure 2 and was built upon here. And through the means of this alien technology, he found a daughter. It's only after he merged his AI with cyberspace did Sage slowly begin to find her humanity. All of these characters find new meanings for their futures by learning from this past and having some 
Sonic meet these pilots is a great way to bring some closure to that side of the story. I don't even mind that they aren't introduced earlier on in the main game. As rushed as it might feel, introducing them now this late in the game lets the Titans stand on their own as cold, terrifying monsters, and then it lets you sit with the tragedy of their downfall on Rhea Island, and only now on Oranos do we finally get the full picture of who they were as people. And I believe this is the only time Sonic directly speaks with any of the ancients. I really like their inclusion here. I do genuinely think they make the ending far more meaningful. And in turn, they also made the digital corruption far more meaningful, as it now finally has been conquered, but only by working together with the ancients that made cyberspace to begin with. But it doesn't end there, as there is one more Coco we have to meet, the leader of the ancients who set almost everything about them in motion, escaping their homeworld, colonizing this new one, overseeing the setup of cyberspace, and the construction of the Titans. And Sonic couldn't care less. As much as they've, let's say, matured Sonic in recent years, I do appreciate the sass that pops out of his mouth the moment he finds himself in front of an authority figure, especially one with a ridiculous redundant title like Master King. But this rock has that title for a reason. His final trial is no joke, because it's... A boss rush with extremely strict limitations that they were never designed for is fine. All these trials have pushed Sonic, but now this is pushing Super Sonic to his absolute limit, forcing him to utilize that parry like never before. And after you conquer that final grueling trial, Sonic has not only cured himself of the corruption, but now he has honed it into a powerful new ability. But as the king points out, it's a fragile one. Sonic has conquered the corruption, sure, but it was only ever harming him to begin with because this was not a power designed for him. These trials were here to help him maintain control, and that's going to be all the more important if he amplifies these skills with the Chaos Emeralds. And with that, Sonic is finally ready to face the Growling Sky. <laughs> The fight against the Supreme Titan starts the same as before, including a cutscene showing off wings that are never seen again. But this time, instead of hopping up to space to piss on the moon, the big orb instead just pops on down and pumps some juice into the bot, giving the Titan its own transformation. The End Supreme. Available in a large combo for only $9.99, the Titan now has boosted abilities that Super Sonic can't properly counter. I mean, you the player probably could, but just suspend your disbelief a little bit here and say that you can't. But now, with the digital corruption mastered, Sonic taps into that newfound power to work in conjunction with his super form to become Super Sonic 2, now sporting those blue eyes and a crackling red aura. And yes, the changes are subtle, but there is a lot happening here. Of course, these colors represent the cyber energy Sonic tapped into through the entire game, which in turn was probably only there because movie Sonic made glowing blue eyes popular, but I also think this represents Sonic himself himself. Let me explain. Blue is Sonic's color. It's what he's known for. But it's completely removed from the Super Sonic color scheme. And that's been true for the entire history of the series. Back in the classic games, I always interpreted the green eyes to mean it's representing emerald power, something like that. Turns out that wasn't the case, but could make for some great headcanon. I know I'm not the only one who thought that we could explain away Sonic's transition into his modern design with a bit of the... Anyway, getting off track. They were green and classic, and the modern design had red eyes, which I took to represent a barely controlled fiery fury. But who knows, maybe it was also just a technical glitch. But here, in Frontiers, with this new form, and in his body language, we see a Sonic that is more in tune with his abilities than he ever has been before. Still serious, yeah, but look at how carelessly he bats away energy blasts, or just skirts around the Titan after it launches its entire higher body at him, and then lays down an insane volley of attacks inconceivable to the naked eye without ever unfolding his arms. Just looking back over his shoulder like it's nothing. He's just toying with this thing. It's cocky, it's arrogant, it's demeaning, but it's Sonic. A subtle hint of an attitude I was worried has been long since forgotten. And you can also double side loop this sucker and make yourself a Titan Burger. Then you just combo on his face until Sonic snaps his fingers and Oh god, I love this anime trope trash. And it doesn't stop there. Not only does it seem like Sonic Team is done with their shame for Black Knight, we go full Shadow the Hedgehog as Sonic ganks the Supreme's gun. And that's the second gun he's stolen in this series, by the way. Shadow, you ain't hard. Get off your dad's bike. You look like a tool. Sonic is from the streets. And 
then he hands the gun off to Eggman, and if you've been keeping up with IDW, y y y you know Eggman loves his Glocks. But the fight does get more serious from here as the end ramps things up as it becomes more desperate, putting the rest of the cast in danger by shooting off energy spikes, forcing Sage to put up a shield which is supported by Sonic's homies, all together using their cyber energy to protect themselves as Eggie preps his new favorite toy. All while that's happening, the end also shoots off a giant death ball that almost completely knocks Sonic out of his super form, making the end almost as powerful as Knuckles, but not quite. Time to get back to the gym, you round bitch. This was just wild watching Sonic spurt out rings. And they're in a cutscene, does that mean they're finally canon again, Sega? But even though Sonic seems like he's down for the count, this is the new and improved Sonic. He's not so far gone that he has lost control of the emeralds. Not yet. They still circle around him and he stops midair and kicks back into his elevated super state. But now, with only a hundred rings left, seriously cutting down the time he has left to take out the end while also needing to use that perfect parry to shut down the occasional rampage to protect his friends. And all of this probably would have been a little bit easier if the Master King had bothered to teach Sonic the perfect target switch, and while he was at it, maybe teach Sonic some tree vision as well. Is that a power? Should have been. After finally whittling down the last bit of fight from the giant robot, Sonic kicks it up into the air, pushing it towards the stratosphere with an onslaught of hits and ending it with one final punch that sends that sucker soaring. And with her enemy finally weakened, Eggman points out that it's now or never, and Sonic zooms into the barrel of the giant gun to be the bullet himself. And not only that, he reveals the very last trick up his sleeve. He's maintained control of this newfound power this entire time, but now it's time to go all out. As blue energy overtakes the golden glow and he begins to radically twitch and glitch, the full might of the ancients now merged with the power of the Chaos Emeralds comes together to give us one final form, Super Sonic Cyber. At least that's what's listed in the game files. So again, that's what we're going to call it for now until we hear otherwise. A power so intense, so erratic, Sonic can barely handle it even with his super form. And with that, Eggman takes aim and fires. And then Cyber Sonic zips around like he has the laser wisp. Why did Eggie even bother aiming? <laughs> now, I may have some problems with the DLC, but if there was any way to top that ridiculous ending to the fight with the Night Titan, I'd say having Sonic achieve a whole new form and then jumping into a gun to be a literal bullet that caps not only a giant robot, but the entire damn moon? Yeah, I think that clears. This is the exact kind of over-the-top nonsense I was hoping for with the original release. And despite anything else I can say about this update DLC, this is so stupidly cool. But with that final push, Sonic has hit his limit. Even as Super Sonic, he is completely knocked out, showing battle damage, or at least an oil-stained pattern. I think that's meant to represent how battle-worn he is, but it also could just be robot blood, maybe a little bit of both. Whatever the case, it's kind of nuts to see Super Sonic Sonic completely winded here. And I do think this shows a little bit more control on Sonic's part. Not only did he survive getting knocked out of a super form, but even unconscious, he's maintaining this power. These are things he's never done before in the series, but it's clear he has burned up whatever cyber energy he had, meaning Super 2 and Cyber Sonic are both gone, and in turn, probably any Psyloop abilities as well. And it's only thanks to the super form Sonic was able to survive this final encounter, but this form too is at its limit as we see the golden glow begin to blink, clearly waning as Sonic shoots towards the earth below, now just one of the many meteors raining down on the Starfall Islands. He also returns to normal just before crashing and gets up just fine, which I thought was a little bit weird. Like, can anything damage this dude? I mean, he tanked some pretty hard hits early on in the game as well, so whatever. Anyway, Sonic gets back up smiling, having laid to rest his cyber-powered abilities along with the ancients and their greatest threat that had haunted them even in the afterlife. 
I'll be honest, there are some elements to this new narrative that feel a bit slapdash and rushed, as a lot of other parts of this update feel, and some of these changes to the story feel like borderline fan fiction, completely contradicting thematic elements and sacrifices of the original ending. Of course, that could just be from my perspective. In my original analysis, I saw story themes revolving around death and sacrifice, and I know they teased Sage's return in that post credit scene, so maybe they're going to say that no matter what ending you choose, the outcome would have been the same? I don't know. But I do still feel like this new story robs a little bit of the impact of the first ending. But with that said, this new story also does a good job wrapping up some other rushed elements from the original release that left me very unsatisfied. And I have to admit, I commend the team for not completely erasing the original ending. They even recommend that you finish that one first before experiencing this new story. So now we have these two paths, both of which hinge entirely on the choices made by Sage, a character who has been conflicted this entire time, but one who has been learning to appreciate life, the importance of love, family, and free will, seeing the value in stepping outside the box and getting creative. And here, with this fork in the road of fate, she finds herself learning what might be the most important lesson of life in general, and potentially a bigger theme for the Sonic franchise as of late. Evolve or die. One path continues the cycle of sacrifice. Everyone was just playing hot potato with it. Eventually, death takes its toll. It's an inevitability. But like I said before, this game had our characters learn from the past to help them forge their future. And that continues on with Sage's new choice. A new path that opens the door for Sonic to quite literally learn to evolve by learning from the ancient past. Sonic's new form represents that evolution. The culmination of eons upon eons of culture, love, and life, bringing out something far more powerful than what any of them could produce on their own. Yeah, again, I will admit, I do wish the Ancients had shown us a bit more Emerald lore instead of dicking around in their VR unit, but it is what it is, and I'm thankful that this story not only gives us another super form to geek out about, but also puts some narrative and gameplay weight behind it. I do hope that Sega keeps the name Super Sonic 2. It's nice and clean, and it fits the same way that Super Saiyan 2 fits Dragon Ball Z in the sense that the physical changes are subtle, but there is an expanded moveset and a massive jump in power. I mean, the story is what made Super Saiyan 2 so damn memorable to begin with. It has to mean something. I suppose you could also call that secondary form Super Sonic Blue or Super Sonic God Super Sonic. These jokes will only make sense to people who've watched Dragon Ball Super. It's, it's okay. I mean, you don't have to watch it. You know what? Screw it. I'm a Dragon Ball Z fan and it's my video, so we're going to make some more comparisons. I've said it on podcasts and in an earlier video, but I do think a more fitting comparison for this new blue-eyed baby would probably be Super Saiyan Kaioken, as that was a combination of abilities. Kaioken was a skill represented by a burning red aura that Goku used as a power multiplier, pumping up his strength and speed, but at a huge physical cost. And the more he multiplied, <laughs> the bigger the toll it took on his body. Super Saiyan, on the other hand, is just a straight-up transformation that, once tapped in, to, Goku could maintain without the extreme cost on his body, and on a couple of occasions, he would use these two techniques in tandem as the Kaioken would greatly boost the power of the Super Saiyan form. Super Coincidence. Super Sonic 2 not only has blue eyes that make him look way more Super Saiyan than ever before, but he also now sports a red aura from a secondary power source, and outside of the awesome trunk slash and the piccolo chest burst we got from the main game, we also got that Frieza energy death ball and that ridiculous too fast to see combo, which we also saw in IDW Sonic. And on top of that, we also got Sonic defying his teacher and going beyond his limits. And speaking of that, man, it is a shame we can't play Super Sonic Cyber our 
ourselves. I'm always going to want my Rainbow Rat back, but there is a lot of callbacks to other super forms in this one. Not sure if any of them were intentional, but here we go. In terms of physical appearance, we can see what is almost a combination of three fan favorite forms. The fangs and the ring eyes we briefly see have drawn comparisons to the evil Super Sonic from Fleetway Comics. And of course, that dark aura will grab the attention of Sonic X fans, as this has some very strong dark Super Sonic vibes. And there's even a little bit more for the X fans out there, or at the very least early internet flash animation fans, because that blue tint and grabbing names from internal files gives us some strong comparisons to the scrap transformation or potential character known as Nazo. And yes, we will be talking about these forms very soon in another video. I do think it's interesting that it's getting comparisons to dark transformations. Nazo may have never been intended to be dark, but thanks to the internet and Chakra X, it certainly draws some of those comparisons as well. In Frontiers, even in this form, Sonic is still on the side of angels, but you still get the sense of an intense, corrupting, volatile, uncontrollable force surging through this form. He feels dangerous here. It's like he has to hurt something, literally needs to be pointed at a target. I know the gun is mostly here for a set piece, but I can't help but wonder if that was also kind of the intent there. Flynn has used that particular metaphor before in his Archie run of Sonic, and it was awesome. But to go a step further, I do see a little bit of hypersonic here as well. Which, yes, that was always going to happen when it comes to comparing any other secondary super forms for Sonic, but indulge me for just a second. While cyberspace is completely different from Super Emeralds, they all do share a bit of a connection thanks to this new lore surrounding the Ancients and their connection to the Emeralds. Their entire society was built around those rocks. They managed to tap into their power to help build and run their civilization, and I would bet the Emeralds help bring cyberspace into existence. Technically, cyberspace energy could be traced back to Emerald energy. We know that Hypersonic has been pitched to Sonic Team by Ian Flynn, which was then shot down because apparently they're afraid of power creep even though they have two different forms here. And that's why Zuka should be fine. And while Hyper didn't make the cut, Flynn has mentioned on his show, The Bumblecast, that he has some ideas on how he would interpret Hypersonic, comparing it to something along the lines of Fleetway Supersonic, showing an erratic, barely controllable, dangerous level of power that was too risky to use all the time and- Oh, would you look at that? That does make sense. I mean, just look at the original Hypersonic sprites. It's a firework display. And you do see some of those ideas in Supersonic 2 and Cybersonic. And really, with all of that considered, I gotta say, Super 2 does feel like something of a compromise. Apparently, Sonic Team is still adamantly against the potential power creep that Hyper could introduce, but they were still okay with copying every other anime trope in the book. Or manga? Manga? Whatever. So instead of Hypersonic, we instead just get blue eyes, and then a brief cutscene teasing something more. But technically, it's from another power source separate from Super, and by the end, they burn through all of the blue, setting Sonic back to default by the end of the adventure. So, hey, it's not technically an elevated Super form. It's just Super Sonic using a base ability, or some other crap like that. However many golden hoops you gotta jump through to make sense of all of that nonsense. And look, depending on what mood you catch me in, I could say that Super Sonic 2 is a cowardly half-measure slap on top of a pile of rushed and unpolished ideas in a game already plagued with rushed and unpolished ideas. There's a lot about Update 3 that frustrates me the more I think about it, but we could also see this as Sonic Team finally willing to loosen up on their strange rules. We have been seeing that here and there. No matter how many conflicting thoughts I have about the overall package of Frontiers, we still got ourselves an open-world Sonic, and they got Ian Flynn on board, a legacy Sonic comic writer on a Sonic game. That is something I never thought I would ever see. We even have a Sad AM reference in a mainline game. The times are a-changing. And when it comes to the core idea and design for Super 2 and Cyber, I'll be honest, I genuinely love them. Could they be better? Yeah, sure. Both in gameplay and in design. I certainly understand why people feel that Super 2 really isn't enough of a change, but I still love it. I do kind of love transitional forms with only slight variations, and that's certainly what this was. I'm always going to be a sucker for super forms, especially in the series. So yeah, could be a compromise, could be the last we ever see of secondary supersonic forms, or it could be hinting at something more. And maybe the 
this is just the first step. Maybe we needed something as simple as these beautiful blue eyes to see what lies beyond that final frontier. And I hope it's hypersonic, and I hope it actually causes seizures this time. <clears throat> Okay, that's gonna do it for the video today, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Gotta be honest, I did not expect to talk this much about Super Sonic 2. Probably rambled a bit too much, probably repeated too many points, but there is a lot of potential here, and I genuinely love it. And whether or not you agree, I hope you had a good time. If this is your first time here, we got plenty of other videos discussing Super Forms or the Sonic games or comics or any other goofy stuff like that. So be sure to check it out. And thank you to the folks who support the channel over on Patreon, especially these fine folks here. Kyle Winter, Cyrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue is my, aka Nick's biggest hero, John, Josh Strider, Hatsworth, Tiny Jericho, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Singer J199, Mr. Boo J, Sam Webster, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Ailey, Chad, Super Hyper Mecha SP Mark II, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Plakonica, Free Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Lederick, Mr. Jubay, Jimmy Duke STR, The Lumberjack, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com or X or whatever. Hi, Nick. That Telos main thinks Nick has the big silly because he still hasn't played Xenoblade yet, RIP. I wish I had the time. I genuinely do. Jin Sayotome, Potent, I'm not reading that. Enerjack 5, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K of Warheads, Ven 101, Paxton Fizbeeson, Darren 7, Stevie. Cole, Twilord. Can you believe it, guys? Spider-Man 2 is just a month away. Spider-Man 2 in just a month. Woohoo, I'm so happy about this information. Way less than a month now. Paisley, Eric Delgado, Kodinsky, Sayonara Robocop, Crimson Rose, Nix the Kobold, Sonic P.A.J., Lunacent, Broxus the Cat, Godzilla, Makuta of Salt, the main source of water is pure water juice, Alexander Watson, Neil Gompa, Conan Kudo, the Lex, the most powerful ship in the two universes, Native Nerd 27, Kaido Prower, Swift Cannon, Spearmint, Omega Man, 21, Penn Adelaide, Other Envelope, Jamie Torres Jr., The Phantomist, Silver Stars, Daza S, The World's Most Unironic 8.5 Tail Stand, One More Sonic Robot, SP is currently undergoing an identity crisis, so he created Evil Clone SP. Going real 2008 YouTuber there, aren't you, SP? MT Mecha, and Yasai. Guys, thank you so, so, so much for your support. The month is only going to get busier from here, so I'm going to get right back to it. So until next time, toot toot, Sonic Warriors. Ah!